we're having a look in 1 Samuel. And God said, it repenteth me that I have set him to Saul to be king. This is verse 11. For he's turned back from following me and he's not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Samuel had to sort out the problem. Samuel had to kill Agag himself. He hewed him to pieces in front of, in front of Saul and all the Israelites because he had to show that God meant business when he said something and it had to be obeyed down to the letter. But it repented God that he'd made Saul the king, that he'd given the people what they asked for. It went on and on and on and on. You know, you can do this with your own kids. They can go on and on and on and on. And in the end, you give them what they want and it's to their own detriment. You realise and they realise that this isn't what they really wanted after all, but it's too late now. The tide can't be turned. Well, it grieved Samuel and it said, he cried unto the Lord all night. And Samuel came to Saul and he said, when you were little in your own sight, were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord set you on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? But I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. The people took the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord your God in Gilgal. Isn't it funny? You know, when people go against God, it's always, I've gone against your God. It's not, I've gone against my God. Somehow you can dissociate yourself from things when you're in the wrong and you can put it on, well, this is what you expected me to do because this is your God. You now have to make amends to your God. They don't own it for themselves. It's like, it's your God and it's not my God. They kept all these things to sacrifice unto the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's also rejected you from being king. Samuel said to him, the Lord has rent the kingdom out of your hands today. And he's given it to a neighbour of yours that is better than you. So the first mistake that he made, God said that he was going to seek a man after his own heart. The second time he made the mistake, he already knew who it was. You know, you tend to read these chapters and you think it's a very short time, you know, between the time when he's anointed to be king and the time when he's rejected from being king and taken out. But I don't know whether you know, Saul was actually in power for 40 years as being king of Israel. And it was in the second year of his reign that he made his big blunder. And God said he was going to seek a man after his own heart. So... We know that David was 30 years old when he became king. And if Saul's reigned for 40 years, that must mean that it's before David's even born that God said he was going to seek a man after his own heart. So God must have been looking. David wasn't even born yet and he couldn't find anybody who was going to replace Saul. Isn't that sad? So it's like Ezekiel when he said, I look for a man to stand in the gap and he's... God's searching everywhere and he can't find anybody to stand in the gap. And this was the problem that God had here now. He was looking all throughout Israel and he could see that there wasn't a man there who he could groom and make king. He had to wait another eight years before David was born and he had to watch and watch and watch and wait and wait and wait until he found somebody. And when he found somebody, he let, some, he let Saul know that a neighbour of his would take his place. 
So Saul was always on the lookout. But I feel for Samuel because he's felt such rejection. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for, for Saul? How long will you mourn? He went on and on and on mourning because he knew that God had rejected him. And it said that he didn't even see Saul again until the day of his death. No more did he have contact with Saul. It was like Saul was over here now and Samuel was over here. And he was mourning all the time because he knew that instead of his sons taking over, he, he must have felt terrible because it, it, he must have felt the burden of responsibility, the fact that he hadn't brought his children up right, the fact that his kids hadn't followed the example that he'd set because he was a godly man, but his children had decided to go their own way. And it must have been a terrible burden for Samuel to carry. But look at that phrase. I'm looking for a man who is after my own heart. So what is it? See here we've got here, David, a man after God's heart. So what is it that God's looking for? Is it somebody tough? Is it somebody who will fight, who will kill all his enemies? Well, it might surprise you, but I've been looking at David's life. God told Samuel that he'd chosen a man who provided him a king amongst the sons sons of Jesse, a battle of And he told Samuel to go to that particular place and to make a sacrifice, or to go and anoint this son to be king. And Saul said to God, if I go there, some, Saul will hear about it, and he'll be, he'll be incensed, he'll know what I'm doing. He'll hear that I'm anointing somebody, and he'll kill me, he'll stop me from, from doing what you've told me to do. And God said, no, it's all right, I've got a plan. You go and make a sacrifice, call, call him to a sacrifice. Don't worry about it, I'll sort it out. So Samuel goes to Bethlehem. Now, Jesse is actually an elder of the city. He's, an, he's classed as an old man. And he sees him as he walks through the gates of Bethlehem. He's there and he, he looks at him and he says, Jesse, I want you to come, you and your sons, to a sacrifice that I'm going to be offering to, to God. I want you to go and sanctify yourselves, wash your clothes, don't come near your wives, do all the things you're meant to do, sanctify yourselves and then come because we'll have this feast. So this is what took place. The feast is all ready. Uh, Jesse comes and the sons pass before him. The eldest one comes up, really lovely looking lad. And he's watching him and he thinks, Lord, this must be the one because he's, he's tall, he's strong, he's, he's a really good build and he looks a fine specimen. And God says, no, I don't want you to look on the outward appearance because that's not what I'm looking at at all. I look on the heart and I don't want you to look at that. So the first one passes by and then the next one comes up and he's strong as well. He's a good looking lad. So all the sons of Jesse passed before him. Well, seven of the sons of Jesse passed before him. And God hasn't set, set his seal on any of them. And he keeps rejecting them. And Samuel's wondering what's going on here. So he said to Jesse, have you got any more children? Have you got any more sons? And he says, well, yeah, I've got one more son, but he's out in the field and he's looking after the sheep. So Samuel just stops playing. He says, right, he says, nobody's going to eat before you go and get that lad and bring him here. I don't know how long that could have taken. That, that could have taken a very long time, but they weren't allowed to eat until this lad came along. And then as soon as he saw him coming, David, God said to him, this is the one, anoint him. So David's brought in in front of all his brethren and is anointed in front of them all. Nobody says what he's anointed to do or to be, but he's anointed, he's singled out by God. Now this is a special thing, this is a big deal. Even though he doesn't know what he's anointed for, he knows that this is something special. Because only the priests were anointed, the king was anointed. So he didn't say anything about his future, he didn't you know, prophesy about what was going to happen, he just anointed him. So... I want to ask you, why is it that David wasn't invited to the feast? Why on earth would 
with Jesse knowing that he was going to have this great honour bestowed upon him. That this prophet of God, who was very feared, you know, when they saw the prophet coming, they used to be scared. They didn't know what he would be saying because they used to come on an errand from God. So why is it that he would not have all his sons there, just have seven of them and not eight? Why is it that David was refused to attend? God's looking for a man after his own heart. David knew what rejection was. God had been rejected. The Israelites didn't want God to rule over them anymore. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. They didn't like God's authority. Everything God does, people want to refuse it. They're not interested in God being supreme, in God ruling their lives. So God knows all about rejection. And he found David, this boy who was out there in the fields, who'd been ostracized from the family. So why do I say things like this? Well, I'll tell you why. There's a lot of scriptures that will give you an understanding about where David came from and how he grew up. Let's have a look at Psalm chapter 22. And he says, but you are, you Lord, are the one that took me out of the womb. You made me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from the womb. You were my God from my mother's womb. Don't be far from me, for trouble is always near and there's no one to help. It's, it's a very sad verse, this, because it sounds as though even his mother's rejected him. I've been cast upon you from my mother's womb. Nobody else was there for me. You are my God from my mother's belly. Trouble's always near him. He's out there in the fields on his own. He's faced a lion, he's faced a bear. Nobody's bothered about his welfare. He's on his own. Chapter 27. David's... He seems to have such a sorrowful life and he's always, he's always sharing his hurt with God because it seems as though God's the only one he can confide in, he can talk to. Verse 9, hide not your face far from me. Put not your servant away in anger. You've been my help. Don't leave me, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. He was forsaken by his father and his mother. He didn't have a family environment to grow up in, David. He was, he was one on his own, and he was outside the family. Chapter 27, uh, 71, sorry. Verse 4. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For you are my hope, O oh Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you have I been holding up from the womb. It's, he refers so much to, to his beginning. You are he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. I am as a wonder unto many. But you are my strong refuge. You were the one that held me up from my mother's belly. Almost sounds as though his mother, I don't know, maybe, maybe his mother just didn't want him. Maybe, you know, I had that. I only found out when my mother was in an old people's home when she was in her eight, uh, yeah, well, late eighties. I only found out that the trouble between me and my mother stemmed from me being born. I had the cord wrapped around my neck. She'd already had two children, I was the third. And in order to free me, the midwife or the doctor or whoever had to cut the cord, but they slipped and they didn't only cut the cord, they cut my mother's womb inside. Mm. And she ended up in terrible, terrible pain um, for nine years. She was on the incurable list they couldn't do anything for her. They'd given her three major operations to try and 
um, help her, you know, the situation that I put her in. She had a septic pelvis, fibroids, prolapse, all sorts of internal complications, which had all been brought on because of my birth. And because of the pain that I'd inflicted in childbirth, she could never look at me with love. She never wanted me. I didn't understand why. I just thought I was this obnoxious kid growing up that was dad's pet because he loved me, he always loved children. Um, but she didn't want me. And it was because of that, the pain that she'd gone through. But she didn't even know the reason for it either. She only told me, it, it sort of came out. And it was like a revelation to her when she was in the late eighties of what must have happened. God must have shown it to her. And we were able to make up. It was all that time though, all that wasted time where there was no family relationship. So I don't know what went on in David's, in David's life at the beginning, why his mother would reject him because she already had seven boys uh, and the eighth one, it's like she just didn't seem to want to know and, and the father felt the same. I have no idea. But it's all intended. God knows what's going to happen, you know. And if we're going to be a man after God's own heart, we've got to feel these things because how can we identify with God? How can we love God and serve God and give God what he's after, the love he's after? If we can't identify with what God's going through. Chapter 131, Psalm 131. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I've behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Isn't that sad? You know, sometimes... It, you can't have your mother's comfort anymore. She can't hold you and cuddle you and take you to a breast anymore. You're on your own now. You're weaned. You fend for yourself now. And it's just like David's been thrust out. And all the time he, he feels like this, this rejection. I'm as a weaned child. My soul is even as a weaned child. Psalm 69. Quite a lot of references, isn't there, to his childhood. David's making his complaints known to God again. And he's saying in verse 6, Let not them that wait on you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek you be confounded for my sake, O Lord God of Israel. Because for your sake I've borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I'm become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. This is his family is talking about again. My mother's children don't even want to know me. In chapter 50, verse 20. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. He's talking about people that are coming against him. You slander your own mother's son. You know, David must have, even after he's become king, he must have known that his family were jealous and envious of the fact that he'd been chosen and singled out from amongst his family. I can identify with that as well because, you know, God called me to the ministry when I was very young and it's almost like I'm the white sheep of the family and nobody wants to know me. You know, like it's normally the black sheep of the family. I'm sort of too spiritually minded to be any family good. And it's, it's always been that way. It's, you know, when, you, when you're called, there's a terrible curse attached to it. Uh, and it's not an easy road to walk. You've got to be certain of where you want to go, otherwise you'll give up. Well, this boy has been brought in out of the fields and he's set there amongst all the sons of Jesse and his father and is anointed. Samuel goes away and, you know, they don't even realise what's happened in front of their very eyes and they send him back out into the field. No respect, 
No thinking, well, maybe we've got it wrong. No, he's just sent out again. They can't cope with it. They can't cope with him being identified in any way as being special, as having some quality attached to him. And David had even been brought in out of the fields and he hadn't had chance to sanctify himself. He didn't know that he was coming for a feast, whereas the brothers had. So the very unsanctified one must have been sanctified in his spirit. His heart, his attitude must have been sanctified before God. And that's what God's looking for, you know, what's going on inside us. Well, from that very day, from being anointed, the Spirit of God came upon David. And it's said that the Spirit of God that had come upon Saul when he was anointed, that very same day, left him. And an evil spirit from the Lord came to trouble him. So David's back out in the field. Saul's in his palace. The brothers have gone home with the father and they're just continuing in normal life. But as time goes on, people see that something's happening with Saul. He's changed. He's, he's a man troubled now. And they can see that an evil spirit's come upon him. And one of the men, one of his subjects, says to him, Look, I can see that you're being troubled with an evil spirit. Let's call for a minstrel to come and play for you. So Saul thinks about it and he says, yeah, he says, go and call me somebody. He says, well, I know a man. And this is what, this is what um, they recommended when they were talking about David. Saul said, to, this is chapter 16, verse 17. Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. He's cunning in playing. And he's a mighty valiant man. And a man of war. And prudent in matters. And a comely person. And the Lord is with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, which is with the sheep. So Jesse got ready a present for the king and sent it by David. And David came in before Saul. And it said, when he came in and he stood before Saul, that Saul looked on him and he loved him greatly. And David only didn't only play the harp for Saul, he was also his armour bearer. He used to go and look after the armour and help Saul. So Saul sent messengers to his father and said, look, David's found favour in my sight and I want you to keep David with me. I want him to stay here at the palace. And this was the king's right. He could ask whoever he wanted. So David stayed. But then something happens. God is now picking a fight. God is now sorting things out. And there's a battle. The Philistines have all gathered their armies together to battle. And they're all there. All around, all, along the, uh, the hilltops. The Philistines are on that side and the Israelites are on this side and there's a big valley in between and they're waiting there. And there's a man that comes out every day for 40 days. This big champion. Now because war's broken out, David has been sent home because David is too young to be in the army. In Deuteronomy it says that you couldn't be in the army unless you were 20 years old and upwards. So David was a youth. He wasn't a little boy, he was a youth. And the three older brothers of David were in the army. But this big man comes out, he gives this threat to everybody. He stands in front of them all. We're, we're now in chapter 17, verse 8. Goliath stands there and he cries to the armies of Israel and he says unto them, Am I a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Well, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. So he's standing there in front of all the Israelites 
and he's giving them this challenge. Not one man would face him. Not even Saul, who was head and shoulders above everybody else. Because this man Goliath was a giant. It says in the Bible that he's six cubits tall. So when you work that out, that means he's 10 foot tall. He's not, you know, like Jack and the Beanstalk, where you see this massive, big, 100 foot man. He's 10 foot tall. So a normal man would be, so a tall man would be six foot two. That's a tall man. So, you know, there's another third on top. And he's coming out and he's wearing all this armour. His head is, has got this massive big helmet on. His breastplate, 600 shekels in weight, this armour. And all his legs are all covered. And he's got this massive big spear in his hand like a weaver's beam. Even the tip of it is uh, heavy. And he's coming out and he's making this boast. And the armour's so heavy that he's wearing. He's got this guy running with him who's the armour bearer. And he's carrying this big shield as well as if he needs it. And he's making this threat. Now all the Israelites, they're all quivering in the, in the shoes. They, this, is, this is terrible. Not one of them can face that man. They don't know war enough to be able to go out there and, and fight this man. And they're all quivering. So for 40 days he's coming out. Now during this time, Jesse's getting a bit concerned about his sons because he knows that war's broken out. And he tells David, I want you to go to the battle, take a present, some food for the captains, and I want you to take some food for your brothers as well and go and see how they're doing and take a pledge from them because I want to know that they're okay. That's his three eldest sons. Take a pledge from them. Bring it back to me because I want to know that they're safe. So David does as he's told and he goes out there. And as he approaches the, the army, where, yeah, because he's going to the battleground and he can't see anything going on, but he's, he's approached there. And he's looking round, and as he comes in, he hears Goliath has come out and he makes this challenge again. Just send out one man because I defy the armies of Israel. I defy you and your God. And David's listening to it. And he says to the, the people around him, what's going to be done to the man that sorts this out? So they're all telling him. And then his brother's here that he's talking to the people. And his, his eldest brother particularly is so angry with David. And he said, what are you doing here? Who have you left those few little sheep with? Why are you here? I know you. I know your naughtiness. I know your pride. And David says, what have I done now? There is no battle. Why are you complaining at me? What have I done now? I've just come here to bring you this present. And then he says, what's going to be done to the man who defeats this, this guy that keeps coming out and threatening so they said, well, the man who deals with this, he'll have great riches from the king. He'll have the king's daughter to wife. And not only that, all his father's house will be free of all taxes, of all responsibilities. They will live in freedom for the rest of their lives. So David thinks, wow, this is my opportunity. I can show the family that I'm for them. I can show them. If I go out and defeat this, this guy, then it's not only me that gets the benefit, but all the family as well. Because David was a man after his own heart. I mean, God so loved the world and all the things that they'd done. You know, he'd had to destroy it twice. He'd sent the flood with Noah. Sodom and Gomorrah, he'd burned that with fire and brimstone. God had done such a lot, you know, to destroy the place. But he really, really loved the world. The world that he'd created when Adam was there, the Garden of Eden, all the, the thoughts that God had for mankind. God loved the world so much that he sent his son. So his heart was for the people. All he wanted them to do was repent all the time and turn to him. His heart was hurt because they kept rejecting him. And David thought, I've got an opportunity now. I can show them. So word gets to Saul. There's a, there's a, a lad out there. And he's saying that he'll go and sort Goliath out. So he said, bring him to me. No, it's amazing. Because don't forget, David has already been working in the palace. He's already been playing for Saul and carrying his armour. And Saul doesn't even recognise him. And he wants to know who this, who this guy is. Well, he's standing before Saul. And David's saying, look, I don't want you to be worried about this man. 
right? I'm going to sort him out. I will do it. And he says, well, how can you do this? You're only a youth. David must have been about 18, something like this. You're only a youth. He says, no, he says, don't worry about it. He says, while I was out in the field, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. In fact, they even had them in the teeth. They'd run off with them in the teeth and I grabbed hold of it and I caught it by the beard after I'd stripped out the animal from its, from its mouth and I ripped it with my bare hands. Now, this is some battle to come against a lion and a bear. I mean, a bear standing up. How big is a bear? Gosh, they tower above you. But he was fearless because don't forget, you know, when he'd been anointed to be king, even though he didn't know it was to be king, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. Just like with Samson, just like with people in the Bible, all these wonderful heroes of faith. When the spirit of the Lord comes on you, something takes hold of you at times and you can do supernatural things because the spirit of the Lord is upon you. So David battling the lion and the bear was showing him that with the spirit of the Lord upon him, he could fight this man. This wasn't a problem for God. He could face him. Well, Saul wanted him to try the armour on. Donned him with all the armour and David's sort of walking around. He says, I can't go out with this on. I mean, that shows he wasn't a little boy, doesn't it? The very fact that he's got the armour on him, Saul's armour, who was head and shoulders above everybody else, shows that he's a strong man, a strong youth. And he said, I can't wear this because I've not proved it. Not because it's too heavy, but I've not proved I've never used it before and it will hinder me. So he takes it off. And Saul is so confident in the way this man's speaking because he knew the Spirit of God was on him. He could, you might not put it in those terms, but you know when somebody's different. You know. You can tell there's something about them. And what David was saying and the way he was saying it built him with confidence because, you know, the whole Israelite army was depending on what David was going to do when he was out there. Once David had been defeated, if that was the turnout, then all the Israelites would have served the Philistines and who knows what they would have done. You know, sometimes if you were going to serve another country, the only condition for peace, rather, rather than being killed, would be if they put, plucked out your right eye. That's what one of the kings wanted to do. In fact, that was the first battle that Saul had when he defeated the Philistines. They said, you can serve us, we'll, we'll sue for peace, but we have to pluck out the right eye of everybody. So who knows what the Israelites would have been subjected to if David had failed. But Saul was willing to put the whole future of the Israelite army on David. So David went out, he picked up five little stones because he was a marksman. He was a cunning man, a man of war. He'd fought already. With his father's sheep, he'd fought. And he went out there. And he said, you come against Israel, but I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. Who are you to defy Israel? I'm coming against you in the name of my God, and I'm going to feed you to the fowls. You think you're going to feed me, but I'm going to feed you to all the beasts of the field. Don't think you're going to get away from me. Well, Goliath was incensed. Fancy Israel sending out one little boy in his mind who wasn't even in the army. He couldn't believe that he'd been insulted so much. This made him so mad. Talk about huff and puff and fee fi fo fum. He was so mad. So he comes out to him. And as he was approaching with all this heavy armour, David didn't wait. And he starts running towards him. He's running for the battle because he knows God's on his side. And he's slinging away there. And he shoots at him. And he gets him right in the vulnerable spot. And it sinks into his forehead, the stone. And he just falls flat on his face. So David rushes up. David hasn't got any armour. He's got no sword. He's got no guns. He's got nothing like that. So he pulls out this mighty sword from out of uh, Goliath's sheath that he hasn't even been able to get out yet. He didn't even think he was going to need it against this little boy. He pulls it out and he whacks off his head. And he's walking through Israel now, through the Israel camp, with this head. 
And all the men, Rah! they can't believe that this has happened. This Goliath, the one that everybody was in fear of, is on the floor and he's been killed by a boy, a youth. So they all rush out now and there was a mighty battle. They all got filled with the Holy Spirit. All had the Spirit of God on them because they'd all been excited by this man, this young boy who'd been inspired. You can get inspiration, you know, from other people. It's catching. When you see God on somebody's life, that makes you strong because you know God can work some miracles now. So they defeated the Philistines. Isn't it wonderful? I think it's marvellous what can go on in a person's life if they really do become vulnerable for God. He was a shepherd boy on an errand. All he'd been done, all he'd been told to do was go and take some food for his brothers and for the captains, just on a little errand. Amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. And he'd left his sheep with a keeper, not even with an older brother, just with a keeper. Why didn't they do that at first when Samuel called for the whole family to come for the feast? Why didn't Jesse put a keeper to look after the sheep? But David was a man after God's own heart. He knew what it was to be rejected. And that was the one that God chose to be a king. And he brought him in. You know, it had great rewards for, for doing this. But you've got to have a holy boldness come upon you. You've got to see injustice. You've got to... Something has got to awaken inside you something that's going on. You know, he, he saw the whole Israelite army being intimidated by one man. He saw it and he heard the words, a man coming against his God. David loved God with all his heart. He used to sit there in the fields playing his harp. He had nobody else to turn to. I was like that when I was a kid. I used to run off into the fields. Sometimes I'd take my dog with me and cry and my dog would lick my tears. But I only had God to talk to because my family didn't understand me. I felt on my own. And I know that David must have felt like this. He only had God and he had his harp and that soothed his soul because he knew he had a communication going here. He identified with God. He had a relationship. And God could see that his heart felt the same way as, as his did. And God had found somebody who had sympathy, who had em empathy with him. Somebody who would feel for him. David, because he knew what it was like, he was living in a palace now, you know, once he'd become king. And, and he thought, why? Is, God hasn't got anywhere to live. They keep pulling him out in this box. Things used to get so hurtful for David when he thought of how people were treating God because he knew how he'd been treated and how he'd been neglected and he was it had done anything for God anything and he wanted God to have the best a temple for the Lord in fact it's, it's David's temple you know Solomon built it but it's actually David's temple because David had the heart that was after God you know you must be very careful when we meet with these Davids because not everybody is going to be a David, are they? Very few Davids. There was only one David in Israel. God, I mean, God had, had to do a lot of searching. He'd even have to wait for this young boy to grow up. You're not going to find many Davids. But when you do, make sure that you're not the brethren who will be full of envy. Because when Jesus came, he was, he was the son of David. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He was anointed. He knew what it was like to be rejected. He felt all the pain that God had felt, even from his family, even from his family. And every time God saw, every time people saw God moving on his life, they would come against him. They were full of envy. Jesus did a miracle in the temple on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they, they were full of envy. They were so incensed that he would go against Scripture and do something on the Sabbath day. They were forever looking to find fault with Jesus. We have to make sure that we're not these people, that we're not envious, that we're not jealous, that we're not covetous of somebody else and the favour that God shows them. 
Let's just have a, a look at a few scriptures that might help us. You know, people that give you problems usually have ulterior motives. It's because they want to get in your position or they want to move you out because they want somebody else there. But there's always an ulterior motive. There's ambition, there's envy. Titus chapter 3. If we live by these principles, you know, it will do our souls good. Because we'll never run into the problems that David's brothers had, or the scribes or the Pharisees. We'll never run into those problems if we live by these principles. This is what Paul's saying to Titus. Put them in mind, those people that you're looking after, Titus. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Saviour, towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we're supposed to help one another with these sort of things to, to say to one another. Keep these in mind, these principles. Philippians 1. Paul knew what it was like to suffer rejection too. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray that your love may yet more abound, more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offence till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ, he was in prison when he was writing these things, and people were taking advantage of him while he was in prison, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren and the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the words without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defence of the gospel. So is there, whatever God allows in people's lives who have been anointed and approved by him, it seems that there are always people there who are ready to take advantage, who are ready to inflict more pain on you. Thank God David knew where to go. Thank God David had a relationship with God, and even when Saul was hounding him, David's complaint was always to God. He would never speak against God's anointed because Saul had been anointed first, and he knew what that meant. He would never speak against God's choice, and he would never harm God's choice. But he would make sure that God knew how he felt. And because of this, he was growing in that relationship, in that understanding of being a man after God's own heart. Because when he ruled, he ruled as a man who was after God's own heart. And it will go back to that as well, won't it? Jesus is the son of David. And the son of David will come and reign. God bless you all.